Okay, discrete optimization, welcome back guys. I'm going to talk about something phenomenal today. I'm going to talk about large neighborhood search. It's a technique which is amazing, truly amazing. We use it all the time, okay? So what is it? So basically what I'm going to show you is that this is an hybridization of local search and constraint programming or local search and MIP, okay? It's basically combining these two techniques that have different kinds of functionalities, but when you put them together, you get something which is way larger than the sum of the parts, okay? So... Uh, let me give you the first intuition using CP. That's where it originated from. And it's, it's also, you know, where it's mostly used these days. But what you do is you start, you start, we, you combine CP and local search. And you start with a so first step, which is finding a feasible solution using CP. You know by now that find, you know, CP is very good for finding feasible solution. It exploits all these combinatorics to find that. Okay? Then the second step that you do is you select a neighborhood. You take the solution that you got from CP and you select a neighborhood. As, as what you're going to see is that this neighborhood is going to be large, okay? Not a tiny neighborhood where you, you know, swap things. And then what you're going to do is you're going to use CP itself to actually optimize that neighborhood, finding the best neighbor in that neighborhood, okay? And then the last part is basically repeating them forever, okay? As long as you have time, you will do that for improving the quality of the solutions that you have, okay? So this is large neighborhood search. It's a combination of constraint programming and local search, but the, the local moves are big moves. You explore a big search space and you use constraint programming to explore it, okay? What is the neighborhood you're going to tell me? What is this neighborhood? What you're going to do, for instance, this is only one example, but this is, a, this is useful for a variety of applications. So what you're going to do is you're going to look at the solution and fix a set of variables. You believe that these variables are nice, okay? So you keep them. And what you do is the neighborhood is going to be finding out values for the remaining variables, the one that you are not fixing, okay? So in a sense, you find a solution, fix some of the variables, Okay, let the other one free and find a better value for these other variables such that you improve the quality of the solution you have found so far. And then repeat, find another set of variables that you fix, okay, and re-optimize that particular neighborhood. Okay, and you iterate these two steps. Okay, now how do you choose a subset of a variable? Typically this is problem specific. You will look at the structure, okay, and you know, and you will ex extract something from the structure of the problems that tells you, oh, I want to, you know, keep that particular, that particular part fixed and re -explore, uh, explore the rest. I'll show you an example later on that are very intuitive. Typically, there are properties like, you know, sp you know, spatial, you know, spatial locations or, or temporal location, temporal notions that are going to be very useful finding these, these neighborhoods. Okay, so typically exploit the problem structure, although in some particular case, you can have a completely random neighborhood that's going to behave very well. Okay, it really depends. So why do we use LNS? Because two reasons. First, CP is very good for finding feasible solution and for optimizing very small combinatorial space. Okay, so in a sense, you exploit the two strengths of CP for finding a high quality solution and you, expl you exploit large, you know, you exploit, you know, local search for scalability. Okay, so in a sense, you exploit the two facets of these two techniques and put them together. Of course, you can generalize that to MIP, okay? You can find a feasible solution using MIP, and you can explore the neighborhood using MIP. That works as well, okay? Uh, essentially, any kind of method you can actually plug in instead of CP or instead of MIP inside, inside a large neighborhood search. It's basically technology independent. It's the basic idea of finding a feasible solution, defining the neighborhood, finding a good neighbor in that neighborhood, and repeating the process. Okay, so let me illustrate that with a very interesting example. Okay, so this is from uh, industrial engineering. It's a problem with a robot. Okay, so a robot has to visit a set of locations and do work at every one of these locations. Okay, uh, it has a service time that it has to spend at every location. That's the time that it takes to actually perform the task at that location. It also has a time window for when it can apply this service at that particular location. And what we want to do is also, and there is also this distance uh, between the various locations. So time window, service time, distance on how you can travel between the location, and that distance is actually asymmetric, which is complicated the problem uh, tremendously. And so what you want to do is find a path for the robot to visit all the location. That's called an Hamiltonian path, okay? And we have to make sure that we satisfy all the time window constraints when we can actually do the service at the various location, and we also minimize the total travel distance. These two constraints are actually have a lot of tension between them, and that's what make the problem very difficult. So this is how you can model it using uh, uh, the scheduling, the constraint-based scheduling. 
so I don't expect you to understand all the details, but gi- let, let me just give you the high-level overview here. You model every activity that the robot has to perform as an activity, uh, and it has a particular service time, which is the duration that it takes. We model the robot itself as a unary resource. It's a vehicle here, okay? And we have a transition time matrix here, which basically tells us how much time it takes to move from one location to another one. And so the optimization is really minimizing the sum of the transition times for all the location, subject to the time window constraints and the fact that uh, the robot can only be at one particular place in time. Okay? So the key aspect that I want to show you here is that this is a very, very simple model. model okay? So it doesn't require a lot of sophistication. It's a very natural modeling of the problem. Now, how do we apply large neighborhood search on this? Well, let's look at what the schedule looks like. So this is a, every one of these lines here you know, is basically the time window of a particular, at a particular location that the task that we have to achieve. And the blue stuff is essentially when the robot is there performing the particular, the particular service. So this is one particular solution. The only thing that you don't see here is spatial, um, the, the, the spatial information. And so what I'm going to show you is basically how large neighborhood search can work. So look at this. What we're going to do is to say, wow, I'm going to fix everything outside this box, so this part of the schedule and that part of the schedule. Assume that this is essentially the path of the robot. And what I will do is basically say, oh, I want to re-optimize that subsequence. Find the best subsequence you know, from this particular task to that particular task and re-optimize that. Okay? Then I get a better solution. And then I move that window and do that at another part of the schedule and keep repeating that. That's what large neighborhood search is about. Take a sub-part of the problem and re-optimize that. Keep the rest completely fixed. Okay? So this is very structure-based. You are basically looking at which tasks are consecutive inside the schedule. You can do something completely random. Pick up random set of tasks and fix the rest and re-optimize the, the task that you have re-optimized randomly. That's also large neighborhood search. Okay? So you can imagine a variety of neighborhood and you can re-optimize every one and you can alternate between them. That's what large neighborhood search is about. Okay? So, so let me give you the sense of how beneficial this can be for, uh, for some particular problem. So, so as I told you, this is an industrial engineering problem, a real problem with a robot. You know, it was solved initially with a branch and cut algorithm, very sophisticated algorithm by the SUS team in, in Berlin. That's one of the top group in uh, mixed integer programming. And they wrote you know, 50 pages of algorithm and theorems and prove all kinds of polyhedral cuts for solving this. And this is the best solution they found. And for instance, you know, 48 there, is not an optimal solution. They can't prove optimality. These problems are so hard that they couldn't prove optimality at that time. Okay? So what we did was applying the very simple model that you have seen and putting large neighborhood search on top of it. And we were looking at how, good, you know, how quickly we could find solutions that were beating these numbers. And essentially in five minutes of CPU time, and this is like a decade ago, right? So we could essentially improve almost all the problems in five minutes and find be- better solution using the very very simple model and large neighborhood search. And to actually improve the larger instances, we needed about you know, uh, 10 minutes. Okay? And so this is the kind of value of large neighborhood search. It's a technique that is extremely w- good for finding high quality solution quickly. And this is evidence of that, a simple case study of that. Okay? So use it. It's really nice for a lot of problems if you want to scale, if you want to find high quality solution quickly. Okay? So use it. As I said, this is a very interesting technique. And, you know, I'll see you next time. Thank you very much.